This is lecture two, screencast, or part two of three screencasts to cover lecture slide set two. Um, in uh, this screencast two and part two, uh, we're continuing on to discuss factors that uh, might uh, minimize uh, communication problems. Uh, this uh, screencast two covers uh, approximately slides 12 through 19 in your uh, lecture slide set. We're establishing already here that um, hearing impairment, hearing loss, whatever uh, words we're going to use to describe it, um, causes or is implicated in communication problems in, in many cases, and that's the sort of the predictable thing. What we have to think about, though, in uh, oral rehabilitation is what can we do to minimize communication problems despite the hearing impairment, despite the, the hearing loss and the other problems a person may have. So what I want you to recall and I want you to kind of keep in mind uh, is the model that I suggested in screencast one here, which was that hearing loss really is a loss of information so that uh, the brain isn't getting a complete version of what happened in the environment or what the speaker was delivering to them. Therefore, anything that adds or restores information, anything that's supplementary, complementary, anything that, uh, that uh, again, restores that information would be something that would be a very useful adjunct uh, to helping uh, communication uh, and communication function. Now, there's, there are a couple uh, of, of typical things that we uh, will encounter in communication, typical natural communication, one of which is just the typical redundancy that occurs in uh, normal communication, that there is multiple sources of information, multiple opportunities spread across a communication encounter. So in general, what we want to do in oral rehabilitation is to try to get the person with hearing impairment to capitalize or to harvest these, these sorts of features that are uh, uh, available to them. Um, another aspect of typical communication is that it's reasonably predictable. Um, and that's to say that uh, as we sort of kind of go down to the next uh, point, point number three, is that there's always going to be some aspect of context that's going to feed and fuel predictability. So where you have um, um, a certain uh, set of life experiences and you're in a particular environmental, uh, contextually appropriate environment, um, Therefore, the communication message is likely going to be reasonably predictable. There's been a bunch of studies that have eliminated information. Uh, for example, people sneezing at a particular point in a message, and the person still understands the message, uh, even though m material has been sort of deleted from that. So these are things that are available to the listener uh, for them to sort of capture or to be sort of more attentive to. Now, the other aspect of um, uh, a way to try to restore or add information is for the person with hearing loss to uh, control or order what's going on in terms of by using different kinds of um, conversational strategies to be able to sort of um, control the information flow and, and to uh, ensure that they, they're getting the information that they need. And that's sort of developing that person into being sort of a proactive uh, type of listener. Two more examples here of uh, other other sorts of additions, and I'm not uh, implying that this is a complete set, but these are sort of some classic examples of um, uh, information sources. Um, the other classic information source that exists here is information that comes from the visual channel. Uh, we're going to talk at one point uh, sort of the idea of speech reading and, and with speech reading uh, is, is never going to be quite as good as you're going to see in the movies, okay? Uh, but there is going to be some information available to the listener uh, and so if there's some information available anything that restores or adds information uh, would be sort of useful. Um, and, then, and then finally, and maybe one of the more important aspects of oral rehabilitation is that energy is added to the input signal from a hearing aid. So what a hearing aid does basically is it adds energy um, to compensate for the hearing loss. And so that uh, the input signal uh, of the talker then is boosted actually in terms of its overall energy to the person that is using the hearing aid. From a, uh, a book by uh, entitled... Uh, 
Audiology Treatment by Valente et al., 2007, uh, Jean-Pierre Gagné, uh, a Montreal uh, audiologist and oral rehabilitationist, um, had a chapter, and this is a figure from his, uh, his book. And so in, uh, in Gagné's uh, model, and you might have seen some other models in other classes, something you might have seen called the speech chain, um, sort of basically the same idea here is that if you got uh, the talker, the speaker over here, uh, who is now providing uh, the message. Um, here, all of this, by the way, is the this all this stuff in here is the environment. So, um, in that context, then um, the the talker is generating a message, which is having to travel through the environment, is picked up by the listener, and then depending on the the pathology of the listener, uh, however much gets up to the brain is what the person ultimately is going to understand. So, when we think about uh, some of these basic features of communication. Uh, this figure sort of illustrates uh, you know, many of them. Um, in your book, actually figure 5.1 in the Scow and Nurbin book, uh, and this is a simplified version of this, uh, of that same figure, uh, has something which has been referred to as the communication function model. And again, it breaks it down into these four basic categories. Again, n n not that different than what you saw in the Gagné, uh, just but much uh, simpler. Now, I got to confess, I'm not really sure here what exactly all of the arrows and the, the dashes and the dots go. Uh, take a look at figure 5.1. Uh, figure 5.1 in, um, uh, in um, the Scow and Nurbin book is particular to, to the visual channel, but we can analogize uh, off of that uh, appropriately and think about, you know, well, what are the factors in each of these um, basic components of communication function that would need to be, uh, that potentially could be optimized. And so that's really what the next uh, slide is. That's what we're talking about here, uh, is, to, is to try to break down those four uh, categories, sender, um, sender, receiver, uh, message, and environment, and kind of put those down into, and think about what are, the cate what are the specifics within here that potentially uh, could be manipulated, potentially could be made better. Um, to help the person with hearing impairment function better. So uh, there are certainly a series of talker variables. Uh, you could think of dialect, the level of vocabulary, what their particular pattern of speech is, um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, signal uh, uh, characteristics, which uh, in a sense we're thinking about not only the acoustics of, of the speech signal, uh, which is also part of it, but we're also talking about some of the linguistic aspects that are in the in the uh, in the message as well. Uh, so again, uh, these are potentially things that potentially can be uh, manipulated, uh, and and again, one of the uh, as as you'll see me. Uh, talk over the, the nature of this, over the, the, the breadth of this course, is that one of the most important factors that's going to help persons with hearing impairment function better is going to be knowledge of context, because once you have knowledge of context, um, you're now able to now uh, use your synthetic abilities to be able to provide uh, understanding. Um, so we will uh, come back to that, but context, in my view, is very, very important. When we consider um, environmental influences, we talked about those earlier, and so the basic idea would be to try to um, reduce background noise, reduce echo, get closer to the sound source. I'll have a summary slide for that here at slide 19 coming up. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, factors, if you will, uh, in the receiver. Um, so, so there are many here. So the organic factors that are associated with their hearing loss, their native intelligence, uh, their attentive abilities, what the status of the visual system is. So th these are kind of the organic aspects. We could think then of their sort of psychosocial aspects. So what's their motivation to communicate? What, what are the demands on them, in other words, and how are they responsive to the demands that are placed on them in order to communicate? Um, What's their level of language development? Obviously, this would be more of a feature uh, for children versus adults. Uh, familiarity with topic, context, uh, and the speech patterns of the talker. So we, we understand people that we're more familiar with much better than people that we're not. Uh, and as I've said to you before, uh, also this notion of the ability to synthesize information, in my view and experience, is a very important uh, feature of persons who do, do well uh, despite having uh, significant uh, challenges imposed by their hearing impairment. 
So in our rehab, basically what we're thinking about is we want to do uh, optimize anything, any and all of those factors to uh, provide best communication abilities. Some of the factors are amenable to information, some aren't. So, so many of those organic factors that are in the hearing loss uh, aspect of the person are really not going to be are not going to be sadly uh, amenable to. Um, to improvement. If a person has poor word recognition due to auditory nerve function or impaired cochlear function, that's going to be very, very difficult um, uh, to, to try to improve. Uh, but some others are uh, with intervention and or counseling, uh, uh, guidance to uh, significant others and to frequent communication partners uh, will be a, a reasonable way to try to optimize many of those other factors. Finally, in this last slide set, uh, in this uh, last screencast, uh, before we adjourn to the final one uh, for this slide set, um, I put together sort of a list here of um, what are sort of conditions for optimal function, whether or not the person has a hearing aid or not, amplification of being a hearing aid. Uh, so this is sort of information I would have printed on a business card that I would sort of give to uh, patients as part of uh, exit counseling and, and, and sort of say to them, look, if you, could, if you do these basic things, Regardless of the level of hearing loss, regardless of the level of your function with your hearing aid, if you do these things, your ability to function and to hear and understand is going to be much better. Uh, so one would be get close to the sound source. So we say get within six feet. Number two, try to be where there is minimal echo. Uh, so um, that might be in rooms where, where there's more uh, uh, carpeting and curtains and things like that. Uh, try to be in a situation where there's minimal background noise. Try to be with a talker who speaks clearly. Uh, there is a notion that we'll talk about later called clear speech. So it's a way to train frequent communication partners to speak clearly. Go back to one of my favorites now. Get, get knowledge of the context. Get knowledge of the topic under discussion. Um, and that will, again, allow your brain to assist in your ability to communicate. Uh, utilize visual cues as available. Almost in almost every communication encounter, there are visual cues uh, in terms of movements of the lips and uh, the articulators that might provide some information. Again, some information. And then finally, uh, try to uh, be uh, a 4A listener. Be active, alert, assertive, and anticipatory. And if you do all of those things, then it's likely that um, your communication will be much more effective. All right, so we'll adjourn here and we'll come back to screencast three to finish up lecture two.